Looking at our unique planet, one thing really sticks out. It really is a blue planet. In fact, 71% of Earth's surface is covered in water. 96.5% of that water is in our seven oceans. And if we look at only the Earth's surface water, only around 2.5% of it is fresh water. And that small number is what we're going to be discussing today. If we look at Earth's 2.5% of fresh water, 68.7% of that is frozen. 20.9% is in lakes. 2.6% are in marshes and swamps, 0.5% are in rivers and streams, and the rest is trapped within all of the organisms that call Earth home, as well as some of the atmosphere. So, to break it down even more, of Earth's total surface water, only 0.009% is in lakes, rivers, streams, and wetlands. But these ecosystems are highly important and highly vulnerable. Besides being frozen, let's look at the largest amount of fresh water, the lakes. A lake is a depression in the earth that is usually fed by streams, rivers, or springs. The largest of which is Lake Bacal in the southern region of Siberia with a maximum depth of 1,741 meters and is home to over a thousand endemic species. Some of the most famous lakes are the American Great Lakes. These lakes formed from the melting of glaciers in the last ice age, and Lake Superior is the largest lake by surface area, covering 82,100 square kilometers. There are several different types of lakes, such as the glacial lakes, like the Great Lakes, Solution Lakes, Oxbow Lakes, man-made reservoirs, volcanic lakes, landslide lakes, and tectonic lakes, each formed in a unique way. Lakes are more permanent than a similar ecosystem, that being a pond. Ponds are a lot smaller and many times are only temporary, a prime example being a beaver pond. Even though they are shallower and less permanent than their lake counterparts, they still serve amazing ecosystem functions. Functions like stopovers for migratory birds, amphibian nurseries, watering holes for wildlife, and so many others. The rivers and streams that feed those lakes and ponds are an entirely different ecosystem. In fact, there are even different types of habitat within a single river. A riffle is a shallow part of the river, usually over a rock bed with fast moving water. A run is an area of a river with deeper, slow moving water. And a pool is a very deep part of that river with a very slow to still water. Each of these habitats have their own species that live nowhere else in the river systems. The largest river in the world is the Nile River, and it stretches for 4,132 miles. That's well over the length of the trip to San Diego, California, to New York City, which is only 2,759 miles. Rivers have a source, or headwater, which is where it starts and is typically in the mountain ranges, and it starts as snowmelt or rain. It eventually leads to a mouth which is where the river ends. Usually it meets an ocean or a lake or an even larger river like the Mississippi. Finally, there is the vague term of wetland. This term encompasses marshes, swamps, fens, and bogs, with each having their unique characteristics and organisms calling them home. Marshes are the most common wetland here in North America. These wetlands usually occur along streams in poorly drained areas. Some examples of marshes are prairie potholes, playa lakes, vernal pools, and wet meadows. These wetlands are characterized by highly organic, mineral-rich soils and non-woody vegetation like lily pads, cattails, and reeds that provide excellent cover for wildlife. One of the most famous and recognizable wetlands are swamps. 
a wetland dominated by woody vegetation, also with highly nutrient-rich organic soils and water-tolerant trees such as cypress. These are very biodiverse ecosystems, with some very unique organisms calling them home. A fen is a peat-forming wetland that receives its water and nutrients from sources other than precipitation, mainly upslope sources or from groundwater movement. These ecosystems can be dominated by grasses, sedges, wildflowers, and rushes. Over time, peat can accumulate and separate the fen from its nutrient source, and it may become a bog. And bogs are similar to fens, however their waters are more acidic. Unlike fens, bogs receive most of their water through precipitation. As a result, they aren't very nutrient rich, which is essential for plant growth. Each of these ecosystems isn't just essential for wildlife and biodiversity, they are important to us. They are a source of our drinking water, food, providing us flood control, improving our water quality, absorbing excess nutrients and toxins before they enter our oceans, and so many other functions. It just comes to show just how important and delicate these ecosystems are, and they need to be protected. Each of these ecosystems I have mentioned face many challenges. Challenges such as pollution. And I'm not just talking about the trash you saw the guy in front of you throw on the ground. Pollution can be in the forms of road runoff, chemical contaminants, agricultural runoff, sewage lagoon floodings, and so many other sources of water contamination. Development near water bodies is another way water systems can be contaminated. The bare soil on a construction site releases the phosphorus into the water body after a big rain. Phosphorus is an essential element to life, but too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. Too much phosphorus in the water system can cause what is called eutrophication. Algae will flourish utilizing this nutrient until there is no more left to use. Without phosphorus, the large amount of algae then dies off. Bacteria start to decompose all of this organic matter and all the bacteria uses up a lot of the dissolved oxygen in the ecosystem. In large enough areas, this process can cause what is called a dead zone. One of the largest examples of this is in the Gulf of Mexico and is about the size of Delaware. Next time you take a drink of water, think about where that water comes from, because you are part of this blue planet, and we need to protect its most important resource. Until next time, keep learning and keep discovering.